Okay, everybody. Um, we'll talk about the this first. Uh, we put a, a waterproofing agent on top of the grade beam before we start setting blocks. The reason for that is that uh, concrete will absorb three pounds of water per cubic foot if given the opportunity to do so. And so that water wicks up from, from the ground uh, through the concrete. And that's why if you're framing, you have to use pressure treated wood for that bottom plate so that it won't rot, okay? Well, we don't want any water coming up into our mortar and blocks, so we put a sealer on it. A typical sealer is the, you know, black tar uh, kind of deal. Um, I prefer something a little uh, more environmentally friendly. Um, the tar, uh, well, it's a petroleum product. We're trying to stay away from those if we can. This is a um, safe coat water shield. Um, safe coats are, you know, unsolicited testimonial, but this is a really good company. I think they're in Santa Fe and they make all kinds of uh, environmentally friendly substitutes for your nasty materials and buildings. So you can check them out. We, uh, we tested this stuff out last year. We did a shed over that way for Charlie and uh, we left the blocks exposed even though we knew they were gonna be going through a Colorado winter. Uh, it was an experiment, but we uh, painted this stuff on. And uh, I understand it was a very mild winter this year, but uh, nonetheless, uh, they look just great. I mean, there's no degradation of the block whatsoever. Now Austin's wetting on top of our waterproofing agent just because we want any masonry product is stronger the slower it cures. So we want water down here, we got the mortar and then we also wet the blocks so that that mortar doesn't hydrate too fast. We're just trying to slow that down. Uh, the University of Oklahoma, uh, Charles Graham again, did a study on, on how much difference in strength you got if you had moisture in the block before the mortar hit it, and it was exponential. It was unbelievable. Now the other thing, which I'm sure Adrian will back up, given that his men mix the mortar, is that the masons sometimes think the mortar is free, and there's you know a couple of mountains of it laying on the ground outside the building that fell out. It's not free. You know our mortar is pretty cheap because it has very little cement in it, and it's clay and sand. Not this course, but the rest of the course. But it still has money you know somebody bought the sand and delivered the sand somebody screened the soil and delivered the soil somebody bought the portland somebody mixed it then somebody brought it over in a wheelbarrow and then somebody got it up to the mason and you were paying that guy the whole time so the mortar is not free so for the next courses for the rest of the, the thing we want to use it's, it's the same material as is in the blocks but it's not the same ratio we use more cement and we use more sand um, because that mortar is not, it's not getting 2,500 pounds of pressure exerted on it. You know, it's just sitting there in the bed and we want it to set up and stabilize uh, quickly and be strong and so we can keep moving forward. The story pole is outside of that. And the story pole is 3 16 thick. So your string is actually 3 16 away from the edge of the building. Now, some masons don't like that. But I think it's a good thing. And the reason I think it's a good thing is we've got a 10 or a 14 inch thick wall. It's gonna be plumb and we're gonna plaster. And if we're off by a 16th on one row, it really won't matter. And the other thing about it, the advantage of it is that you know, we're, we'll, what we'll say to all of you as you start laying is set the block to the string. Set the block to the string. But don't touch it. Because if you touch it, then the wall's crooked. Right. You know? So if you have this 3 16 forgiveness, you set it, and basically with rookies, I just say, set it as close as you can without touching it. You know? But if, you're, if you do this for a while, you get pretty, pretty used to what 3 16 looks like you know, and you're not off by a 32nd, you know what I mean? So I think it's advantageous to, to have that 3 16 of forgiveness. Okay, well the modulus of rupture is a, it's a test that you do at a laboratory when they're testing the blocks for strength. There's a compressive strength where they put it in the machine, a plate comes down, 
crushes the block and you get a PSI for the block. The modulus of rupture is a point at which the block will snap. Okay, and so that test, what they do is they set the block on a table, but they have two rods underneath the block. And those rods, like if we were gonna test this block for modulus, the rods would be two inches in from the end, so they'd be right here and right here underneath the block. And then they press down on it with a single rod, which is right here. And so they're gonna snap it. You know, that it's just a matter of when. And that when they read on the meter and you it was a rupture. Gotcha. Which is a much smaller number than the compressive strength. Compressive strength of these blocks is probably around eighteen hundred. Um, whereas the modulus of rupture would probably be about sixty. I think fifty is passing. So, you know, it's a it's a lot easier to snap them with the three rods than it is to crush them with a, a plate. But when I was talking about a modulus rupture in the mortar, I was talking about a rock that was bigger oh, gotcha. than the mortar joint, and hence you you start loading weight on it, and it's gonna it's gonna snap. Could you tell us, like, when we start making our own blocks, mm -hmm. how do you find the people that test this? Is it government? Is it private business? No, they're private, and and every big city has uh, you know soil engineers, testing labs, uh, because they all build roads. Uh, okay. You know, and they all test concrete. They test concrete cylinders constantly. You know, they're they're everywhere. We're using CU's lab. We've got a real good relationship with these people, and it's wonderful to have a university, you know, involved in what we're doing and care. You know, and well, why don't you try this or why don't you try that or you know, it's it's fun to, to work with them. They're good good folks. Okay, I need a block. Yeah, let me get that one. Here's one of the uh, advantages of these 10 by 14s and, and why I think they became a common size uh, in the Adobe world is that when we set, set our corner and we set this one in right in here, we have our head joint offset without a cut, okay? And then you can use full blocks all the way down and you're, you're not cutting. Now, we're gonna have some cuts, you know, we gotta cut right here, obviously. Um, but we're, we're minimizing them, and if you can work with the architect, it's a, it's a nice thing to minimize the cuts. Okay, um, Jason was just mentioning, you know, a software designed to optimize the bricks and that sort of thing. When you're figuring this, you can't just take the length divided by the 14 inches or whatever, you gotta account for that head joint. So we account for a half inch head joint. But what if your mason's got a little fat out there in the middle? Oh, bummer, you know? Okay, right. So you give it the half inch and then you give it a little more, depending on the length of the wall, yeah. so that you can, you can have a, a fat mortar joint here and there and still make it without a cut. It's easier to make a fatter mortar joint than it is to cut a block. Okay, Austin's getting pretty far ahead of himself with the mortar. That's because he lays the blocks pretty fast. But when you're, when you're laying up the blocks, you don't want to get any farther ahead of yourself with the mortar than can stay wet when you get there. Because if you got dry mortar, you're not getting adhesion. Okay, here's the airplane. See, he lays it away a little bit. And then pushes it in, and woohoo, there's the head joint. Just like that. This is a bed joint. This is a head joint. 